Um, uh, I started um, last week sort of trying to focus again on on some sort of hopeful numbers um, because I, I actually think that there is still a lot of things to be sort of, you know, hopeful and excited about. I think, um, you know, the victories and the ground that's being gained is pretty, it's still tentative and it's still, um, you know, certainly uh, lots of lots of risk of of things going the other way but um you know reassuringly the numbers over the last week have continued to decline um and uh and so you know from a peak in the middle of april of about 4800 new cases per day in ontario um today there were about 2300 new cases in ontario and so that continues to be a significant drop which is a combination of the lockdown measures as well as the increasing numbers of uh, of vaccinations that are that are happening at this point um so you know in some parts of ontario up to sort of 50 percent of people have been vaccinated certainly across the country across the province more than 40 percent of people have gotten their first shot uh about three percent of people have gotten both shots um the um and in Halton region, um, as of next Wednesday, anybody over the age of 16 will be able to book their first shot through the region. So right now, anybody who has a, you know, a, a chronic medical condition that's on the list, anybody that's over the age of 40 um, can book on Friday, anybody over the age of 30, and then next Wednesday, anybody over the age of 16 will be able to book their first shot through the region. And so that's really exciting because that's everybody that the vaccine is sort of currently approved for in uh, in in this region, right? And then likely the next step will be um, starting to immunize people in the 12 to 15 um, age range as well. So these are all really good and exciting things that are happening. Um, I think the big news story over the last 24 hours um, has been um, the fact that Ontario is going to pause administering the AstraZeneca vaccine to, um, to people as a first dose. Um, and so, you know, I guess it, it warrants sort of taking a second to maybe sort of, you know, talk about that and and sort of think a little bit about about that decision um and you know i've also been reflecting a little bit about the conversations that i'm going to have with my patients um who have had the the their first dose uh, be the astrazeneca vaccine and and what will be the the next step for them um so when it comes to kind of any medical decision um what's happening is a a weighing out of the risks and the benefits of that particular um decision um so the as the real world data has unfolded with the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, it seems that perhaps the risk of having those blood clots is maybe somewhere in the range of, you know, one in 25,000 to maybe one in 100,000, whereas initially the thought was that it was maybe more in the one in 500,000 range. And so the real world data seems to show that the risk of getting those severe blood clots is, is higher um, than some of the initial data suggested. So um, the province is looking at that number and then looking at what the risk of complications from COVID-19 is for the population that's going to be getting the AstraZeneca vaccine and considering what the risk of complications from COVID vaccine, uh, COVID infection for that age group um, versus the risk of those blood clots, um, the decision was made to, to at least pause um, the administration of that vaccine. Um, I think I, I would echo what um, Teresa Tam has said um, in that the people that got the AstraZeneca vaccine um, made the right choice for themselves, for their community, um, because what they did is they gave themselves a certain degree of protection from uh, getting severe COVID-19 um, and a certain degree of protection against um, transmitting COVID-19 to other people um, at a time when community transmission was really high um, and the risk of complications from, from getting COVID was, was high as well. Um, and so now the question is for a lot of people, well, what's next? Um, the province um, is likely gonna be receiving more doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. It seems that the risk of those blood clots with the second dose is much, much, much lower than with the first. So it's more like one in a million, as far as we know right now, uh, with the second dose versus the first dose. Um, but, 
it certainly could be that um, people who got the first, uh, the, their first dose being the AstraZeneca vaccine um, may be getting a different vaccine for their second dose. Um, and there's research that's going on right now, which will probably be uh, published in the next week or so about what the impact is uh, for people who get different uh, vaccines for their first and their second dose. Um, and my understanding of that data is it actually looks really promising that people who get two different vaccines um, do mount a really good immune response um, against COVID. Uh, so that that data is going to be really helpful kind of informing those decisions moving forward. Um, right now, my understanding is that the province has not paused the AstraZeneca vaccine for the second dose. Uh, and so I think, you know, over the next few months, people who got the AstraZeneca vaccine for their first dose um, will get definitely clearer guidance <laughs> than we have right now about what those steps are going to be. Um, and probably will have to sort of, you know, make an informed choice about what um, what they they want to do moving forward. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I think I, I said this last week, but we're watching science unfold in real time with very, very, very significant real world consequences. Uh, and we don't usually see science. We don't usually get such a front row uh, a seat to scientific discovery. And we don't usually get to watch data unfold and evolve as quickly as we have um, with the with the pandemic. Um, and so this is um, you know, this this is definitely something that happens with medical discoveries. Um, a really promising therapeutic agent um, gets approved, it gets used widely, and then the real world data shows an unexpected or an unintended outcome. And there needs to be a process of pausing and reevaluating, seeing if this is still the right option, seeing if this is still the best option for the problem that we're trying to solve, um, and then you know, decisions are made kind of uh, moving forward. So um, the bottom line is that people who got the AstraZeneca vaccine um, didn't make a bad choice. They made a, a good choice for themselves in that moment. Um, and, uh, and we'll have to watch the data and the recommendations really carefully as things unfold with regards to that, that second dose. Um, the UK is opening up a lot um you know the us is opening up um you know again we'll have to watch and see what the numbers do in those places but um certainly that gives a lot of sort of hope i think um on the horizon for maybe a, a brighter and better summer as more people are immunized and the numbers continue to go down <laughs> I may have missed it, Anna. Uh, did you tell us what happens for those of us that did not get the first dose of AstraZeneca? We got Pfizer. Will we get Pfizer as our second dose? Would you yes. listen? Okay. Yeah, so that there, there, yeah, there won't be any change for people who got Pfizer for the Moderna vaccine um, with regards to their second dose. Again, you know, depending on the results of this study, um, because there doesn't seem to there there isn't a supply issue also with the um, with the Pfizer vaccine. Like there, the 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 increasing supply of the Pfizer vaccine, I think, in a lot of ways, has made it the most kind of reliable vaccine that we have. Um, and there do continue to be some supply issues with the AstraZeneca and the Moderna one. So I don't think anybody that got the Pfizer vaccine um, should should be worried about not getting a Pfizer vaccine as their second dose. Um, people who got the AstraZeneca or the Moderna one, again, depending on this data coming out of the UK with, with mixing and matching um, vaccines, may be offered Pfizer as their second dose. I heard on the radio today that um, start, uh, starting next week, the Pfizer vaccine, we're going to, Canada's going to get a million doses a week yeah. for about five weeks. Yeah. yeah. So, and that should speed up the not having to wait four months. Absolutely. For your second shot. No, I think that I think that's that's very true. Um, certainly, there has been um, people who have um, you know cancers who are on chemotherapy, uh, people who have blood cancers, people who are, who are who are severe immunocompromised, people who are on dialysis, high risk healthcare workers, and First Nations people. Currently, in Halton, are eligible for an accelerated second dose. 
So that's that's again because there's there is much more certainty about the um, the availability of the vaccine moving forward, um, and also we're getting close to the point where you know like everybody that's that's eligible is going to be able to kind of get a vaccine probably in the next few weeks, right? And as at least in Halton, um, and so. Um, We'll watch that list. I suspect that list of people who are eligible to get an accelerated second dose will continue to expand to include more people. Yeah. I have um, my brother and uh, his wife are going to New Orleans, um, from Michigan to New Orleans. Um, I think this week, maybe next week. Um, but not only am I green with envy, but part of me is just like, how are you doing this with i mean because we are like so shut down and they're they're traveling to new orleans it just it just seems crazy yeah um i mean in the, the it, there's a, there's the policy question right and i mean in the us the the sort of restrictions on travel uh, uh, and and movement and all of those things have have never been as strict as they have been in canada um and also like i think we're up at about 50% of americans having had both doses right like it's a huge number of people in the us who who have been doubly vaccinated um and so i think that there is um maybe a bit more confidence for people um, with regards to to traveling um, now that then they, they've been doubly vaccinated. Um, I mean, Health Canada and and sort of the the um, you know, the bodies here in Canada have not been as sort of, you know, enthusiastic and open as as Dr. Fauci has been around recommendations um, with regards to people that are that are fully vaccinated. But I think a lot of Americans are are hearing what Dr. Fauci is saying in terms of, you know, if you're both vaccinated, you can interact, no masks, right? If you're doubly vaccinated, you can travel. If you're doubly vaccinated, you can you can do all of these things, right? I think, you know, that also speaks to just how many people are vaccinated in the States, right? Um, we're not there yet in Canada. We're actually nowhere close to those kinds of numbers. And so that's why it is really important to continue to adhere to, um, to all of the public health recommendations with regards to masking and physical distancing. Uh, the first vaccine provides really good protection against severe illness and hospitalization. Um, but you can still get COVID um, if you've been vaccinated once. Uh, it may mean that you have a very, very mild course of disease. Maybe a, you just might lose your sense of smell and taste. You might just have a little bit of a sore throat, um, but you can still transmit it to, to, um, to somebody else. Um, and so um, until you know, there's a lot more um, vaccination, I think, you know, continuing to um, follow all of those guidelines with physical distancing and not gathering and not being indoors and not being in crowded places and masking is is still really important. But the 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 payoff in terms of hospitalizations is also happening as well. Like every day there's fewer um, hospitalizations. We're under 800 people in the ICU today for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. Every day there's fewer and fewer people on on ventilators in the province. Um, the province hasn't had to initiate any kind of triage system in terms of who's going to get ventilators. And so, you know, what we're doing right now is really working. So it's important to hold the line. Um, yeah, this is a tricky question. I don't know if you could answer it, but um, uh, um, one of our uh, grandchildren is in daycare and um, up until now, we haven't been babysitting any of the grandchildren. Uh, you know, we see them from a distance. But both of the parents are frontline workers. One's a nurse and one works in the grocery store. Um, <clears throat> so if they've been off for two weeks, the child, the grandchild, has been off for two weeks and, and essentially in isolation, it, is she, uh, automatically free of COVID and because we've been vaccinated once, could we babysit her even if we wore masks or should we just not keep, not risk it? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, a tough 
call, right? I mean, like the strict the strict interpretation of the public health guidelines is that you know, like you know, the the household household shouldn't be sort of gathering. That you shouldn't be sort of you know spending time together um, even indoors at this point. I mean, those are the those are the, that's the strict interpretation of the of the public health guidelines at this point. Um, and so I kind of have to stick with those recommendations because you know, four, fourteen days for sure um, is is generally what the isolation period is. Um, there are some cases of people having symptoms shortly after the 14 days. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it would be sort of, you know, like your house is essentially bubbling at that point, which is kind of, unless, unless it's kind of a single parent headed household that's bubbling with another household, the recommendation is still against that, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's it's a tough. I understand. Like, it's a tough call. Um, but mm -hmm. sort of under the strictest interpretation of the public health guidelines, I would say still still hold off doing that. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and that uh, is uh, New Orleans anywhere near New Orleans? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. This is not what you, it you're is. such such a Canadian. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. New Orleans. <laughs> um. In yeah. fact, I don't say it like some would say it, like Nolens or something. So, um, yeah, um, yeah. I think you know we'll have to see what what happens. I mean, the 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 lockdown order is is set to expire on May the twentieth. Um, I I don't know what's going to happen then. Um, so you know, I don't know if there will be any significant changes um, to how things are 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 happening right now. Um, that will be, I guess, maybe maybe not a topic of conversation for next Wednesday, but for the Wednesday afterwards, because that that it's set to expire on on Thursday. So we may have a sense of what's going to so. happen early next week. Um, but I think the general feeling is that things will probably continue um, the way that they are until cases have dropped um, significantly more so than they uh, than they are at this point. Um, some of the measures that I've heard are, are that the province would like to wait until um, cases are at least under a thousand new cases a day. Um, that they would like to wait until at least there are fewer than you know 150 people in intensive care um, with COVID-19. Um, and so we're still we're still a long ways away from those kinds mm -hmm. of numbers. Uh, you, you how mentioned... long until? Sorry, how long until we? Uh can possibly have back surgery or knee surgery? Uh, great question. Um, <laughs> Three years. It's really hard to say. No. Um, Next fall, she said. Maybe. For my knee. <laughs> and I haven't even seen anybody about my back. Uh, yeah. They just won't answer us at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so unpredictable right now. You know, they're needing to make decisions on a week by week basis about which surgeries can go forward and which surgeries um, can be postponed. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it is, it's a very tough process um, that hospitals are going through in terms of that decision making to decide kind of, you know, it's, it's because every, everything people don't get booked for surgery for no reason, right? And so it's well, really course. hard to make that call about sort of, you know, what's essential and what's not essential. Um, and, you know, there's still there's still um, a backlog of surgeries from, you know, the first time that we were locked down in terms of hips and knees and those kinds of things. And so um, it's going to be a, it'll be a, a long and difficult journey back to, uh, to, to um, being on top of those things again. Yeah. And as you said, three years, that's what I'm counting on anyway. <laughs> it's hard to, yeah, very hard to say at this point. Yeah. And you mentioned um, getting a second dose and when um, you rattle off different things. Um, we've had the first dose and um, I've got uh, f like four of the five criteria to say, don't get COVID. Um, so, if, if we get stuck and we had to become the babysitters, um, could we be designated a, like a caregiver and, and then apply for the second dose before we tried it? But that's not a, a, a magic bullet that the risk is not gone yeah. just by getting second dose is it it's still no, slight it's, it's, it's substantially <laughs> reduced right after the yeah. second dose like it's substantially reduced right now there there isn't a mechanism um for for people to 
get the second dose who don't sort of meet those specific criteria. Um, but I mean, like emergencies are emergencies, right? And, you know, sometimes, you know, households need to step in and support one another um, when there are emergency circumstances. And I mean, you know, COVID or not, if if you need to be a, a grandparent in a caring role, you need to be a grandparent in a caring role, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody gets sick, okay. somebody's in an accident, somebody's hospitalized. I mean, those are just the that, that those are the realities of life that you just you have to deal with right and so you know when those circumstances arise you just try to do those things as safely as possible right so masking and distancing and good hand hygiene and and all of those things to try to minimize the risk yeah okay, okay. right Thanks. we're luckier in burlington than you are in oakville because the girl across the hall from us has just spent two weeks in joe brandt with uh well i guess they called it an essential heart problem, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. And people are having eye surgery, et cetera, around here at Joe Grant. I'm surprised. Any surgeries where somebody doesn't need to be admitted to hospital are potentially a go, right? And so- It's in the hospital. So if people, if people so two like weeks. Some, some day surgeries, um, can go ahead because um, they, there's a good chance that person's not going to have to take up a hospital bed, right? Um, but then again, sort of essential surgeries are essential surgeries, right? Um, yeah, so, yeah. you know, hearts, cancers, um, you know, emergencies yeah. that come in in the middle of the night, like those are those are things you just can't, you can't postpone. Yeah. I, I was up at the hospital this morning and it's very quiet. <laughs> yeah. But really, they, yeah. because unless there's something very essential they they shut her down and um so yeah. i it's going to when they try to ramp it back up it's quite a tricky process because um they've got uh, in ontario they, they said there's like three hundred fifty thousand um scheduled surgeries that have been postponed yeah. that's a, that's a third of a million surgeries yeah. Yeah. so all around the province there's such an enormous backup um, you know, but I guess, that, you know, like if there's one thing that, that this pandemic has showed me is that human and if you, human ingenuity is pretty incredible. Right. And so if you put a lot of, you know, kind of, you know, people together to sort of, you know, plan and think about, um, how to do these things, like really creative solutions come forward. Like I don't, I don't have solutions to that problem off the top of my head. People way smarter than me are going to be, you know, trying to, to make that happen. But, um, yeah, I'm opt I'm optimistic that there's some brilliant minds that are going to be working very hard on, on that problem over the next little while yeah we're very adaptable there'll be um <laughs> surgery over the phone oh, something <laughs> like that yeah 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 <laughs> all right i have a meeting at 4 30 i have to get to um but okay. it's nice chatting with everybody we'll talk to you again anna yeah thank, thank, you, thank you anna thank you. bye okay bye, bye. bye everyone